Can you guys hear me okay? Cool, let's get started. So, first things first, I'm not a lawyer. This is not legal advice. <laughs> um, I will not assume any responsibility for anyone's use of this information. Mention of products is made through the presentation. I've not been paid by anyone, blah, blah, blah. No one sue me. <laughs> I'm also not a cannabis expert. I'm a hobbyist, and this is going to be, this entire talk is from the perspective of a hobbyist. Uh, commercial cultivation is an entirely different beast, and I do not purport to know anything about that. Uh, also, don't believe anything I say. Do your homework. <laughs> So now we're going to talk about a perhaps relatable situation. Uh, you have a nug, you're picking it apart, maybe you're getting ready to pack a bowl or roll a joint, and you see a little, a little seed in there, and you think to yourself, I can just plant this seed, water it, and then a couple of weeks later, I'm just going to have a bunch of free weed. Who's thought about this? Yeah? Yeah? No, don't do that. <laughs> um, hopefully uh, this talk will elucidate why trying to grow weed from like a stray seed you found in some bunk weed is a bad idea. Uh, alrighty, so we're gonna be covering uh, growing weed from a hobbyist perspective, not about industrial or commercial marijuana cultivation. That is a different answer. Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about operational security concerns. Uh, this talk is in no way comprehensive. There are 500 plus long page books dedicated to this subject, and I am just barely scratching the subject, or scratching the surface. Uh, I specifically also will not be talking about hydroponic systems. That is a completely different setup that in my mind requires a lot more attention and care and testing and chemistry and stuff that I'm bad at. So we're, I'm going really for like, the easiest way that you can do this. What is this? It's growing weed in your closet or a grow tent or anywhere you have space inside your house. Um, this is not uh, how the pros do it. This is how normal people can have weed. <laughs> um, what is cannabis actually? It's a plant. It grows all over the world. Uh, it was probably originally from somewhere in the Himalayas, but it's typically found in the wild, like throughout the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, hemp production uh, has been used. Hemp is a material that, it's a textile that can be cultivated from the uh, stem of marijuana. There are really strong fibers. Uh, so it was used as a textile for thousands of years. Uh, in, 19, in the 20th century, with the war on drugs and all of this cannabis craze, hemp was being culled from the wild, even though it has really low THC um, and cannabinoid concentrations, uh, possibly as a consequence from the war on drugs, but not just hemp, also uh, other more psychoactive strains of cannabis. It's real sad. Uh, what else about cannabis? Uh, it's in the angio angiosperm phylum, which is the seed producing uh, phylum of plants. So this is fruiting seeds. It's in rosales. Other fam famous members of the rosales order include strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, apples, pears. So uh, these are all fruiting plants. Uh, cannabis is one of those. It's in the Cannabaceae family, and fun fact, there is another famous member of the Cannabaceae family, and that is hops. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit about reproductive morphology. So cannabis is actually usually a dioecious plant, which means the plants are either male gendered or female gendered. Uh, occasionally, if you really fuck up a grow, you can get a hermaphrodite, uh, <laughs> which would be a monoecious plant. But as a grower, that's not what you're trying to do. What you're trying to do is, is produce female-only plants that have unfertilized flowers, which are called cincinilla, which I don't know how to say that in English and Spanish, that literally means without seed. Um, these flowers are gonna have, are gonna be the largest, they're gonna be the most resinous, have the most trichomes, um, and also the highest cannabinoid content. So your goal as a producer is to produce the most bud and the highest quality bud, and the highest quality is gonna be bud that is unfertilized without seeds. Uh, where can you do this? Uh, <laughs> if you Google this, there's a lot of really creative setups online. I would say if you're a beginner grower, maybe just you're scrappy, like look around your house, uh, figure out where you have space. If you don't have space, you can get one of these extremely convenient grow tents. 
Um, they're lined with mylar on the inside, which is a like high reflective sur surface so that you can make the most, you can utilize all of the light from your light source because of this highly reflective surface. Um, the outside of the grow tent is typically constructed from like a heavy duty material like Cordura. So they're actually pretty sturdy. Uh, they're also, another benefit of getting one of these grow tents is that they have pre-sewn holes for ventilation. So it pretty much is like as hermetically sealed as you can get. Um, you're not gonna have, have to worry too much about light leaks. And if you wanna throw in like some kind of ventilation or filtration system, it already has the holes sewn in for that. Uh, they're also pretty easy to set up, so if you can set up like a camping tent, you can probably set up one of these. I did it in about 20 minutes. Um, when should you do this? So this will depend a lot on your local geography. Oh, this slide got messed up a little bit. Uh, so if you're growing in a cellar, typically cellars maintain a pretty constant temperature throughout the year, so you can do it whenever. If you're doing it inside and you live in the northern hemisphere, you might want to wait until winter, and that's because you're going to be using lights that produce a lot of heat. So it will provide free air conditioning if you're doing it in, in winter, and you won't have to like pay for heating. Uh, if you're living somewhere that's warm year-round, you're probably going to try to find a cooler place to do your grow. But you typically want a place that's not varying in temperature too much, uh, like outdoors, unless you live in California, and that's also a different talk. <laughs> Why should you do this? Um, there are a lot of reasons someone might want to grow weed in their closet, and this, these reasons will vary person to person. Maybe you're just really excited about gardening and you want like a fun project. Uh, for people that are like new to gardening, weed is actually a great starter project because it grows really fast. And it is literally a weed, so it doesn't require like the same attention as something like roses might. Um, marijuana is, oh, and it's also pretty adaptable to a lot of different environmental conditions, so that's pretty cool. Uh, if you live somewhere that marijuana is criminalized, it actually, in some scenarios, could be safer to grow it yourself if you practice good operational security. Uh, if you have more time than money, so uh, I think there's this misconception that somehow if you just like throw up a little planter on your windowsill and water it every day for a couple weeks that you're just like magically going to have a ton of dank butt at the end. No, this is work with a capital W. So really make sure that you're willing to like set the time aside to do this. Um, and if you do that, you will be rewarded. <laughs> How? Okay, this is the bulk of the presentation. How are we going to do this? So when you're talking about growing weed, there are two principal constraints, space and time. Uh, you don't necessarily need to make a Gantt chart, but <laughs> you might consider at least throwing some key dates up on a Google Calendar or something. Uh, let's explore the space dimension first, though. So there are three species um, in the cannabis uh, genus. Ruderalis, indica, and sativa. So Ruderalis is, as you can see on this uh, infographic that someone else made that I stole from the internet, <laughs> the smallest. Uh, it also has the lowest THC content. But what's notable about Ruderalis is unlike cannabis and sativa, it matures according to um, just time. So cannabis and sativa enter the uh, flowering phase according to the length of the photo period, meaning as the days shorten, chemical signals are triggered within the plant to let it know to start producing bud. Ruderalis is just like, oh, I've been alive for 100 days. I should start producing bud. So this is really interesting for when we get to talking about seeds. But typically, people aren't growing ruderalis uh, for consumption, like cannabis consumption, because it has this low THC content. But it has this uh, auto flowering capability that we'll get into. Uh, indica, as you can see, is a little bit bigger than these small ruderalis plants. It's a bushier plant. It matures more quickly. Um, and it also does produce like a larger yield, typically. Sativa, if you're not constrained on vertical space, uh, is a really good option. Unfortunately, it grows really tall. So if you are constrained in vertical space, this is maybe not a great plant for you. Um, yeah. Also, sativa is like less beginner friendly, but th it depends on like what kind of effect you're looking for. Cannabis, you're gonna get sativa. You're gonna get like the more creative, active high. Uh, indica, it's like the couch lock effect, like uh, appetite stimulant, uh, sedative. Uh, different like psychoactive properties. 
the minimum space requirement that I would recommend for a single plan, like if you're looking at getting one of those Mylar grow closets, would be two feet by two feet by five feet. But even five feet, um, you need to leave enough space for the light, like around the light, because it is going to be producing so much heat. So like you don't really want it touching anything. Like you don't want fires. <laughs> so definitely like leave enough uh, vertical space because uh, yeah, if you're really watering your plant and giving it a lot of nutrients, it's going to grow. How much time do you have? So otter flowering is going to be the fastest. So this is the um, Ruderalis uh, genetics, plants that are um, genetically engineered to have this Ruderalis uh, component will typically mature the most quickly and you don't have to change the light cycle. The plant will know on its own to start beginning to produce flowers. Um, but they're also going to be the least potent. If you have the most time, um, let's go ahead and look at my convenience rubric. <laughs> so I prefer the effects of sativa, so I prefer to grow sativas. Unfortunately, sativas are the least convenient plants to grow because they require the most vertical space and the longest period of time to reach maturity, like from seed to harvest. Indica is typically in the middle. It's like a medium-sized plant. It takes a medium amount of time to grow, and medium amount, I'm talking like about three months, 12 weeks from seed to harvest. Uh, the Ruderalis hybrids um, are going to be the fastest, but you're going to get the least amount of ye uh, yield and also uh, the like the lowest like psychoactive like uh, like cannabinoid content. Okay, so I talked about this a little bit, but these are two words that you're going to encounter when you're online shopping for seeds: uh, feminized and auto flowering. Any seed that you think about planting, you specifically want to look for the feminized label. Feminized mean that the uh, breeder who has produced the seed has exposed it to certain environmental conditions that will cause the mother plant to produce exclusively female seeds. So the reason you don't want to plant a seed that you randomly found in some weed is because one, it tells you the grower of that weed was careless. He let a male plant fertilize his female bud, so it's like you just don't know anything about that plant. It could be male, it could be female. Uh, it was probably an accident. Um, and, you know, there could be other weird things going on with the seed, like some kind of defects or mutations. And, and it, this is kind of a lot of work, so you don't want to waste your time. You really want to go in and, like, look for the seeds that you know are feminized, that you know are going to give you a good yield. Um, auto flowering, these are the Ruderalis hybrids that you don't have to modify the photo period. They're just going to mature on their own and begin producing flowers. Uh, I've never done auto flowering, but I've heard people have had good success with it. So if that's something you're interested in and you don't want to like get too finicky with the light setup, this might be a good option for you. Timeline. Okay, so realistically, you're looking at three to four months during which you're not like going to DEF CON, for example. <laughs> uh, you can't be planning like European vacations or having a ton of other stuff to do during this time because you're going to need to be pruning or watering or doing something with your light setup for at least three hours a week. Um, during like the duration of your grow. Uh, at the beginning, there's also going to be a larger time requirement while you're acquiring all the materials and setting up the space for your grow, and then also at the end when you're curing, trimming, harvesting, um, and disposing of the bodies. <laughs> Um, the last thing that you want to do when you're getting ready to set up your grow is to talk to the people that you live with. So if you live with your parents or with a roommate and you know that they're not cool with weed and you think that you can somehow hide this from them, you are woefully mistaken. <laughs> Uh, don't try and do, don't be a dick, be a reasonable person, ask for their consent. Growing marijuana in your living space has the potential to significantly reduce your quality of life. Um, not just from odors, but like there are legal implications to this as well. So make sure that everyone that you're living with is cool with this and it has signed on for it. And just use common sense, like one illegal hobby at a time, guys. Uh, if you have a face that cops like to fuck with, like maybe it's not a great idea for you to grow weed. <laughs> um, if you're constantly getting complaints for noise or smoke or uh, if, if people are coming by your house a lot, if you like to talk to people about your fun illegal hobbies, you probably should not grow weed. Um, also, never consent to a search without a warrant and uh, exercise your Fifth Amendment privileges. Uh, yeah, talk to a lawyer. 
Uh, don't take pictures of your grow. Don't talk about your grow. Uh, this is going to be really hard because you're going to feel so proud about it and you're going to want to show people, but if you live in a prohibition state, this is a really bad idea. <laughs> Okay, step one. So uh, let's buy some materials. Where can you do this? Uh, Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's. Uh, this, again, is a function of like your risk tolerance and your ability to transport things with a vehicle. I don't drive. I am like a pedestrian and bicycle only transportationist. I'm a professional passenger. So I actually procured most of my materials on Amazon. Uh, I looked up what Amazon's policy was for providing information to law enforcement. I provided a link on here. Um, there was some document they have that says that they require a valid and binding legal demand, AKA a subpoena, to surrender any information to law enforcement. So um, yeah, law enforcement knows that I bought a grow tent on Amazon. Eh. Uh, if you are worried about, uh, you know, people surrendering your information to law enforcement, maybe go to Home Depot and just buy things cash, and maybe not all in one trip. So, like, on the trip that you buy the grow tent, don't also buy, like, your high-discharge lamps. <laughs> um, and then for seed sourcing, uh, you can... Uh, I'll get to this later in the slide, but there are lots of places that you can buy seeds. I also highly, highly, highly recommend checking out your local hydroponic store if you live in an area that has one. Those people are super knowledgeable and they can answer any questions you have about setting up your grow. And it's also like someone you can kind of talk to about this and be reasonably confident that they're like not an ARC. <laughs> Okay, so what do you need? Uh, you need a space, so closet, cabinet, or otherwise fully enclosed, like somewhat hermetically sealed place that you're gonna do this. Uh, you need a light source or two or three, and that's because uh, the plant at different points in its life cycle will have different lighting requirements. Uh, you're gonna need different sizes of pot because as the plant grows, its roots are gonna develop, and you wanna give the plant enough space to really like develop as complex as a, of a root system as it needs to, because the more space it has for roots, the more your growth you're going to get on top, the more vertical growth, the bigger your plant's going to be. Uh, uh, but you also don't want to just like plant a seed in a big ass pot either. So like the plant size should correspond roughly to the size of the container that it's in. Uh, you're going to want a Christmas light timer, and that's helpful. That's going to be helpful for when you need to change the light cycle for your plant and trigger it, trigger this uh, flowering period. Uh, you're going to want a nutrient kit. One of these grow boxes is great because they actually come with instructions and a, like a feeding schedule. So um, you don't have to do a ton of research about like what your plant's nutritional requirements are. You just like follow the rubric. It's like a very paint by numbers type of thing. Um, you're going to want seed, obviously, and some soil. Uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm not going to cover hydroponics. The reason I really like so soil grows is because soil is a natural buffer, so you don't have to worry too much about like measuring the pH of the water before or after you water the plant. Um, the soil will just kind of like absorb any like extremes, and you'll be pretty safe with your grow if you use soil. Uh, other things that you might consider, and by consider I mean you probably definitely need this stuff too, <laughs> is uh, two lights, one for vegetative growth, one for flowering growth, a fan, so um, actually wind is really important for stem development of a cannabis plant, so you're going to want like kind of a steady flow of air blowing on your plant so that it develops those really robust stems and roots. Um, Air filtration system, so this is kind of operational security. Uh, at minimum, I would say HEPA filter if you're having a small grow. Uh, if we're talking about like up to six plants, I would consider something that's like maybe a carbon filter or some kind of forced air system. Uh, I've never set one of these up, but this is where going to the, your local hydro store and talking to the guys at the counter there might help you out. Um, humidity and temperature monitor. Uh, like I said, cannabis is pretty adaptable, but you're want to you're gonna want to keep like a relatively humid, like around 30 to 50 percent, and like a relatively warmish environment. Cooler in the evenings is typically fine. So if it's like dipping into the 60s or the high 50s, that's okay. During the day, you don't really want it to get much hotter than like 80. Um, trim scissors, so you're going to need that at the end when you're harvesting, latex gloves, dear God, do not harvest without gloves, you are going to get so high and like not in a fun way. Um, 
uh, a watering can, pH strips, again, I don't fuck with that, I just use soil, um, and goggles definitely if you're gonna be using like a high intensity, like high lumen light, you wanna protect your cornea and like just wear glasses. Uh, seed sourcing. So fun fact, it's actually legal to buy, sell, and possess non-germinated cannabis seeds in Canada in the UK. So you actually will find a lot of these seed vendors based out of those countries. They take credit card, you just put in your info, and then like two weeks later you get this really stealthy packaged um, thing. I won't tell you how like what stealth tactics they use, but it's very clever. And within this package, um, are the seeds that you ordered. And also, this is nice because these are pros, like you can really look through their catalog and see like, you know, I want this type of indica or I want something that I can harvest in 10 weeks, like they'll have all that information on there. Uh, alternatively, if you know someone who's a breeder, you can get seeds from them. Alternatively, you can do this thing called taking clones. Uh, there are some pros to this. You don't need to germinate seeds. With a clone, uh, you're basically taking a cutting from like a somewhat mature plant already um, and then propagating it. Uh, the other cons are that you, because you don't have to germinate seeds, you can harvest much more quickly. You kind of are starting a plant from like the middle um, and you have guaranteed genetics. So if your clone, if the mother plant is like, you know, a female, sativa, whatever, this is gonna be 100% a genetic clone of that. So it's, it's guaranteed what you're getting. Cons, they are diminishing returns when it comes to using clones. So like if you're taking a clone of a clone of a clone of a clone, you're not gonna harvest that much blood. Like every generation is less and less. Also, after you go a couple generations, like genetic mutations and pests and all sorts of weird things start to happen. So there is kind of like an upper limit to how much you can use cloning. This also depends on local availability. If you're living in an area where like you, you're just not plugged into the community, you're not gonna be able to get a clone. <laughs> Okay, so a lot of this talk is just general information, like botany and gardening, like how do plants work? So plants are typically absorbing um, light in two parts of the spectrum, um, and that's because this is how the sun works. The sun is like a full spectrum light, and you're also gonna wanna purchase lights that are full spectrum, but the two main important parts of the spectrum are on this blue axis, so these are the shorter wavelengths, around like 450 nanometers. This is important in the vegetative cycle of plant growth. So at the beginning when your plant is really like producing a lot of leaves and getting a lot of vertical growth. Um, and then towards the later part of your plant's life cycle, like around the 650 nanometer wavelength, this is more the orange and yellows. And these, this is the time of year, like fall, when the sun is kind of at a lower angle and you're naturally getting this kind of wavelength. You wanna grow light that simulates or multiple grow lights that um, are optimized at different points in the spectrum. So at the beginning of your grow, you're gonna try and use a blue light that has a lot of, um, that is in this 450 nanometer wavelength. Towards the end of your grow, you're gonna switch to one of these orange lights to simulate like these long summer days. So um, there's a critical choice that you're gonna make when selecting a light to use for your grow. Should I use LEDs or should I use this cornea melting high intensity discharge light? <laughs> um, the pros of LEDs are honestly like they're a lot safer. Um, I don't know if it's true anymore that it's a higher upfront cost because like now they're making these in China and they're actually pretty cheap. You can get them on Amazon for even like a hundred bucks, like a thousand lumen, you know, some kind of crazy output LED light. Uh, they're also optimized at the spectra that I was talking about earlier. And they have a switch on the back and a built-in fan, so you can like easily switch between vegetative and flowering, and it'll emit different wavelengths. It also cools itself and doesn't get super hot because it just consumes less energy. Uh, the downside of using LED is that it's not, you're not gonna get the kind of yield that you would get if you use one of these high intensity discharge lamps, but the high intensity discharge lamps come with significant drawbacks. The drawbacks are, if you're trying to be stealthy, forget about it. The electricity bill, if you're using a high intensity discharge lamp, is gonna be through the roof. Uh, if anyone else is paying the bill, or if the landlord looks at the bill, they're definitely gonna see a spike in usage. Uh, it requires more infrastructure because you can't just plug it into a wall, you need a ballast. <laughs> um, they're pretty heavy and kind of expensive and require a little bit of electrical knowledge to set up. Uh, and like 
when I was using this setup, I was constantly worried that it, like the lamp would explode and it would just set my closet on fire. That didn't happen, but it is a very powerful light. Um, that said, you will get a lot better yield if you use this, and this is what, from my understanding, what a lot of professional growers are using. Oh. Also, they produce a lot more heat, so if you're like growing in the winter or whatever, these are nice, you kind of get a two for one. Um, if you are worried about lights that generate too much heat, LED is a, a better option because they run cooler. Soil. Okay, so the main thing I'm going to say about soil is don't go outside and grab soil and bring it inside and use it to start your grow. There's all kinds of bugs and critters and bad things in the soil that you definitely don't want to be bringing inside your house. <laughs> um, buy soil from the store or Amazon or somewhere. The, the soil that comes in those bags is sterilized, uh, so you can be pretty confident that you're not getting anything you don't want, like pests or whatever, like in your house. Um, also, uh, you can opt to mix your soil with something called cocoa core. Uh, cocoa core is like this pretty cheap um, thing. It's basically ground up coconut husks that people use for hydroponic growth principally because it's non-reactive. Uh, but I like to mix it with my soil, especially if it's like uh, soil with a smaller particle size. For marijuana, you kind of want a medium soil, not something that's like super clayey, like a really small particle size, and also not something that's like a sandy soil that has like too much drainage. You want kind of like a middle of the road soil. So um, you can just go 100% soil or do like a 50-50 thing. Uh, I usually do like 30% cocoa. 70% uh, like some kind of organic soil with soil amendments mixed in already. Uh, also, when you find a soil, you want to make sure that it's a neutral pH, so pH of around 7 with NPK values um, that are roughly equal. Uh, marijuana, most plants are thrive in like slightly acidic soils. Cannabis tends to do best in soils that are around pH 7. Okay, I talked a little bit about wind, but here's just like a fun little graphic. Make sure you have a little fan that's blowing on your plants. It'll make them happy. <laughs> okay, so when we're talking about how much this is going to cost up front, I would say best case scenario, if you just get everything like on the cheap, like Amazon or AliExpress, you're looking at $300. Um, of course, there's also going to be recurring costs, like with electricity and water and nutrients, but just setting up your grow, this is what you're looking at. If you're just wanting to do one grow, this is not going to be more cost effective than like just buying it off the dark net or like buying it from a drug dealer. So this is really something for someone who wants to like sustain and like make that upfront investment to really like make it worth their time. Recurring costs, obviously electricity, um, soil, you cannot reuse soil between batches. Once you do a grow, you're going to have to chuck all that soil. Uh, you've been, you know, putting a lot of nutrients and fertilizers uh, in that soil. Also, the plant's been uh, drawing a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So the soil, once you do a grow, is not good to reuse. Um, seeds, you'll also have to buy every time. You guys are all beginners, as am I. I don't, I'm not a breeder. I don't know how to like produce feminized seeds, so keep that in mind. Though cloning is an option. Set up. Alrighty, so you've ordered all the materials. Um, you don't necessarily have to wait for them all to come in to get started, because the only things you're going to need to get started when you first set up your grow is just like a little pot. You can even use like an egg carton, uh, a little bit of soil, or cocoa. So for germination, you can just use cocoa core. Uh, seedlings don't have nutritional requirements. They just need to be wet and have light. Um, and you also don't need a grow closet for this, because even just literally, literally a flashlight will be enough light to germinate your seed. <laughs> so you can just put this in a cardboard box uh, with your little egg carton uh, and your seed and your cocoa core and a flashlight or some kind of like low power light, like a bedroom lamp or whatever. Uh, make sure it's really close to the top of the soil though, uh, because, uh, so there's two problems with this setup. Can anyone identify what the two problems are? Yeah. Stretch is one of the problems, which I'll talk about later. What's the other one? This person planted multiple seeds in one pot, so like then what happens? You're gonna have to like somehow, yeah? Well, you have a problem because there could be a male and a female inside that you don't know them, so later on it can cause uh, cross contamination between the two seeds. Well, not even that. Like this is what how big weed gets. 
Like, how are you gonna like take these apart? Oh yeah, you can't. You can't transplant after. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I mean, you can you can try to pick them apart, but when the the plants are really young like this, you don't want to be messing around with the roots too much. So yeah. one to one, guys, one to one. Just put one seed to one pot. That way, you don't have to be like trying to pull apart these like weak, fragile little like budding marijuana plants. Um, so this young gentleman over here mentioned stretch. The, when you see the plants that have like this really long stem and then some leaves that are like falling over, like they can barely support their weight, this means the grower is putting the light really far away from the plants and marijuana is like a really ambitious plant like it wants to grow towards the light and it's just like stretching as much as it can to get to the light so it can photosynthesize more but what happens is that it, do it doesn't have enough time to develop the stem so you really want to bring the light as close as possible to the plant so it doesn't have to do this oh, also at this point in the plant's life you're looking at a 24-0 light cycle so um, when you're first germinating, just leave the light on 24 hours. You know, it's gonna be a bedroom light or a flashlight or something. Uh, after you see it start breaking soil, go ahead and switch to 18 hours on, six hours off. So that's when you're gonna wanna plug in your Christmas lights timer and get this plan on a schedule. Uh, the 18-6 uh, cycle is what you're gonna use for the duration of your vegetative growth, which is gonna be like 50% of your plant's life cycle. Cool. So you're chugging along, your little plants are growing, and then maybe a couple of weeks in, you notice roots starting to come out of the bottom of your pot. It's time to replant your plants. <laughs> so this is actually a really good setup right here. You see like those white little hairs at the bottom, and like a lot of them starting to grow around the bottom ring. Uh, that's when you know it's time to transplant. Uh, this is also good because uh, the roots look really healthy. This is like actually the spitting image of what a super healthy root system looks like for a developing marijuana plant. If you're getting, if you're taking your plant out of the pot and see lots of brown and yellow roots, that means you're probably over watering and you have something called root rot. Um, so at that point, it's not completely lost. You may want to try and salvage your grow, like trimming away some of those dead roots, but really this is what you're looking for. All right, so here's a little schematic I found off the internet, which is like not even fully representative of what I'm talking about, because this is the hydroponic grow, but this is the, the, gonna be the basic setup of your closet. So once you switch your plant, so you've repotted it, you switched it to an 18 on, six off light cycle, maybe you're moving it into your closet now, you're setting it up with like a real grow light. Um, you're gonna wanna have your grow light between 12 and 24 inches away from your plants. Unless you're using the high intensity discharge, those things are literally so powerful that it will burn the leaves on your plants if you keep it really close to the plant. So just kind of experiment with that. But with LEDs, it's pretty safe to keep it like pretty close to the plant. Um, and then the plant won't have to work so hard to get to the light. Uh, yeah, you got your fan. Uh, unless you're doing a lot, a lot of plants, you don't necessarily need to set up like this inlet and outlet filter system. That's more of like a heavy duty thing. And also if you set it up and you have like a small closet, you could end up with like a wind tunnel inside your grow closet. Um, but they do sell, like you could, you're, this is like a hacker con, right? Like you could make your own out of like, you know, a computer fan, like one of those like desktop, um, like hard drive cooling fans, like those totally work for this. Okay, so you're chugging along in your vegetative growth. You have your light on for 18 hours a day. Your plant is starting to produce like more and more leaves. Um, at this point on your feeding schedule, you'll probably notice that it's telling you to feed it a lot of nitrogen, and that's because that's what's helping the plant develop like these big fan leaves. It's helping the plant get that vertical growth. Um, you might have to even start doing some pruning because you want your plant to grow in like a particular direction. Like it's typically better if you're growing indoors to have like shorter bushier plants than like taller lanky plants so maybe you're like doing some training on your plant to grow in like a particular way if you want to take clones this is a good time to do it so cloning is basically just cutting off like one or two of the fan leaves sticking them in some soil waiting a couple of weeks and hoping roots grow and then you have like a whole new plant um we're going to talk a little bit about topping this isn't strictly required for growing, but pretty much every grower that I know does this. Um, so what topping basically is, is a training method for marijuana plants that will produce more, um, top, basically more meristems, which is like more 
points for the bud to grow on. So the main shoot that your plant is growing out of, the main Mary stem, if you're just grow, starting to grow a plant, it will just be one. Uh, what you're gonna do is pinch that, the top of that main stem off, and what it'll turn into is actually two main stems. You wait a little while, the two main stems are coming along, then you take the, those two tops off, then you have four main stems. There is a natural limit to how many times you can do this, <laughs> um, but you can probably top like three or four times over the course of your vegetative growth and get a plant that's like, you know, still has like some healthy growth on the side, isn't like splitting at the center or anything, um, and always producing two shoots every time you top. It's pretty scary also the first time you do this because you're like, I'm hurting my plant intentionally. Like, what if it just stops growing? No, it won't do that, I promise. <laughs> um, also taking clones, it's pretty easy. You can just cut at a 45 degree angle one of the uh, branches, uh, stick it in some soil. There are chemicals you can add to the soil to help the root propagation, but I've never used any of those. It is a weed, like, it will probably grow roots. <laughs> All right, so about six weeks into your grow, you're gonna be looking at your big bushy plant and realize that it's about 50% as big as, as the space that you have allotted for it to grow. And at that point, you will need to change the light cycle, unless you have auto flowering. I'm not talking about auto flowering here. But at that point, you're gonna need to change the light cycle from 18 hours on, six hours off, to 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Uh, also, if you bought a special light for flowering, like one in the orange spectrum, you're going to want to switch to that flowering light. And the change in the photo period and also the change in the spectrum of light that you're giving to the plant are going to cause hormonal changes in the plant that will cause it to begin to produce flowers. So um, the initial phase in flowering, uh, oh, also there are... Um, I should talk a little bit about this slide. Uh, on the left here, we see the beginning of the female plant. Uh, this like fine, white, hairy thing is called a stigma. Uh, and this is what, uh, in nature, like the part of the plant that pollen would collect on and where the seeds would be produced. On the left, that small little ball is a pollen sac. That is your worst enemy. <laughs> if you see one of these growing on your plant, you basically have to throw out the whole plant. All of the work that you have done up to this point is for naught. Um, some growers, if they see that one of their plants has turned into a herma hermaphrodite after they switched the light to 12-12, will try and just pick off the balls, but the plant will just kind of keep producing them, so good luck. Also, marijuana in nature typically isn't pollinated by pollinating or by insects. Um, it's pollinated by wind. So plants that are wind pollinated actually produce a huge amount of pollen. Good luck. So a couple weeks after you uh, flip the light cycle to 12-12, you're going to see lots of these fine stigma hairs growing all over the plant. Um, this is a good sign. You're also going to notice that your plant is growing like up to an inch a day at this point. <laughs> so in the first three weeks after you flip the life cycle, you're going to be experiencing a huge amount of growth. Uh, anytime, so about once a week, you're going to be wanting to adjust the, the height of the light because you're always wanting it to be a consistent height away from the plant. So you don't want the plant to be like running up against your light and burning itself, but you don't want the light to be so far away that the plant is like not optimally like photosynthesized. So photosynthesizing. Uh, also at this point, after stretch, you're going to see these like fine white crystal like frosty things start to develop on the leaves. Um, I have a, a close-up of that. These are called trichomes. And these are like these resinous mushroom shaped hairs that contain all of the good stuff, all of the cannabinoids, the THC, the CBN, the CBD. Um, that's, that's the reason we're doing this whole thing. Uh, they also contain terpenes, which are awesome, but are also not your friend when you're trying to do a stealthy grow. Terpenes are, oh, and here's more close-ups of pretty white stigmas and trichomes. 
Um, terpenes are the aromatic oils in cannabis that really give it that dis distinctive scent. Uh, so in nature, terpenes uh, are do have this adaptive function of like repelling predators, but also luring pollinating insects. Cannabis doesn't require pollinating insects; it's entirely pollinated by wind. So really, the function of terpenes in cannabis are to ward away predators, which means they have this really aggressive, strong scent that is offensive to a lot of animals, but humans actually quite like. So um, if anyone here also likes sativa, you may have noticed that sativa has like a really piney scent often, and that's because sativas tend to have more of the terpene alpha pinene in them, which is the terpene that gives conifers their distinctive pine scent. Um, it's not just alpha pinene, there are a ton of um, terpenes in cannabis, and also if you get more into like nutrient um, like uh, like the fertilizer requirements of your plants. There are ways that you can feed your plants to produce more of a particular type of terpene. So this is actually something as a grower you have some amount of control over. Uh, just do your research. I'm not a terpene expert, but there are fertilizers you can use to really produce those like strong scents in your uh, cannabis. Uh, yeah, so terpenes aren't your friend because they produce strong odor. So something you want to be aware of at this point in the life of your plant is like if these odors are leaving your apartment or house, basically. Uh, you might want to be turning up the HEPA filter at this point. Maybe you want to have like some kind of um, outlet to the outside if you live on like a top floor. Uh, if you don't have a way for these odors to get out, they're going to find a way out. So make sure you have a plan for that. Uh, also, uh, yeah, around this point, it's like a couple months into your tax, so you're, or into your tax, <laughs> into your growth, so you're going to start getting those high utility bills. Um, yeah, these are just things to be aware of. Also, really, like, don't take pictures. There's all kinds of metadata uh, on those files, and yeah, there could be visual clues in your pictures to tip off people to the location of your grow. Um, also, even if you're just printing those pictures out, like, printers leave, like, a unique... Uh, sequence of dots, uh, like a signature basically on the printer. This is how like Reality Winner was busted by the NSA when she leaked those documents. So like really like try not to document this guys. Even though you'll really want to, it's gonna be so pretty. <laughs> okay, so now we're approaching the end of the grow. Uh, your, your bud is getting nice and frosty. Uh, the trichomes are starting to change from like that clear glass color to more of like a milky color, maybe even like an amber color. Uh, you're gonna wanna start like not fertilizing your plant anymore and just feeding it water. The point of this is you kind of want your plant to utilize all of those lingering nutrients that are still in the soil or like trapped in the flowers. Um, there's also some stuff on the internet that indicates that it makes your bud smoother to smoke if you just kind of only feed it water for the past couple of weeks. Uh, but the idea is you just kind of want it to use up the nutrients that are there and not add any more chemicals uh, towards the end. Also, it'll your plant will start dying off at this point, so you'll notice like the leaves will be starting to yellow. Um, cannabis is an annual plant. It's not a perennial plant. It's one and done. You plant it, it produces seeds, and then it dies. So this is the beginning of the end. Uh, the million dollar question that everyone wants to, that everyone has their own answer to is when do I harvest? Uh, you're going to be really eager at this point. You're going to see the trichomes coming out and be like, I should harvest now. No, the point you want to harvest is the point at peak resin production. Peak resin production will typically be when 50% of the trichomes or more have turned to this like amber color. If you wait longer than that, um, the THC in the trichomes will turn into a THC metabolite called CBN or cannabinol. Uh, cannabinol is a non-psychoactive cannabinoid, which has, which is great for the therapeutic effects. It's like a slight, has a slightly sedative effect. It also is an appetite stimulant. So people that are using cannabis, like cancer patients in chemotherapy, like using it for these therapeutic purposes, might want to wait longer to harvest, maybe to when like 70 or 80% of the trichomes have turned to this amber color. But if you're like me, more of like a recreational user, and especially if like the type of bud you're interested in is, is sativa, you don't want these sedative effects, you're gonna want to harvest it maybe a little earlier, like 30 or 40% of the trichomes have turned to the amber color. Awesome, so uh, you think your work is done, but it is not. 
Uh, <laughs> now the real work begins, harvesting. So you're gonna cut down every part of your plant that has this bud on it. Uh, you're gonna put your gloves on, you're gonna get your trim scissors out, you're gonna trim up your weed, uh, and then in your grow closet or wherever you have space, away from a window or direct sunlight, you're gonna let it dry out. Um, you know that it's ready and cured when you can snap one of the stems and hear like a slight popping sound. So you want it to be dry enough that you can smoke it, but not so dry that like it's just this like dried out like crumbly bud. So you're looking for that sweet spot. It's usually about three days in, but again, it depends on like the local environmental conditions of like wherever you're drying this stuff out. Enjoy your weed, but then dispose of the evidence. <laughs> so um, the trichomes are pretty much only going to be on the flower and like maybe on some of the leaves around the flower, but uh, you're going to have a lot of these fan leaves and the roots and the stems and a lot of stuff to, to throw away. I would recommend getting some of those really thick two millimeter trash bags. Uh, putting all that shit in there and then like finding a dumpster, preferably not the one that's right outside your house and disposing of uh, all of your organic materials there. Uh, you're gonna have to throw out the soil too. Uh, if you have a garden, you can probably just cut up the roots and throw the soil in your garden. If you have a compost, you could compost all this stuff. Uh, the pots that you're using to grow the weed can be reused, but like I said earlier, I don't recommend trying to reuse the soil. Oh, make sure you clean the pots between grows. So, yeah. Marijuana is legal for recreational and medical in a lot of states, mostly in the West and the Northeast. California Proposition 64 went into effect earlier this year. Nevada Question 2 has gone into effect. It's been in effect now for a couple of years. Oregon, interestingly enough, has a marijuana subdomain, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you live in a non-prohibition state, I would really encourage you to uh, check up on like what the regulations are in your specific jurisdiction. Um, you know, there are kind of these like state laws, um, but really as far as growing is concerned, a lot of that is left, left up to the district, like not even the county level, like literally your town. So just figure out what your local laws are for growing weed and try to adhere to those as much as possible, unless you're in a prohibition state, in which case you're just going to go for stealth. Here's the fun map. There's also a ton of info online. Um, I actually really found the uh, microbrewery subreddit to be super useful because people are doing the thing you shouldn't do and posting lots of pictures of their grow and being like, should I harvest, should I harvest, should I harvest? <laughs> Um, but there's also just like a lot of good information on there and it's a nice community. I'd also recommend these two books. Uh, they're pretty comprehensive and yeah, people on YouTube that are like, you know, running their grow farms legally in Canada and make lots of cool videos. Uh, that said, there's no substitute for hands-on experience, so grow out, go out there and grow some weed. Or don't. Maybe you can just get on the dark net and buy this stuff. Maybe that would be easier. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah? So I know some people, like, after they've dried the weed, they'll put it in the jars and, like, burp them once a day to, like, slow down the moisture you the plant. Do you know if that's, like, worth a lot of it? I do that because I've read on the internet that's a good thing to do, but, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a good thing. Anyone else? Yeah. Um... So those pictures, I'm not sure who they belong to. What was the name of that plant? It looked really pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so marijuana is actually a really pretty plant. Um, sometimes people get concerned when they're growing, being like, my leaves are purple or you know some weird color. And actually, for especially indica dominant strains, that's totally fine. <laughs> yeah. But, like, do you know? Who that was? Like, oh no, yeah, these are all off the internet and like, yeah, right. please don't hurt me, people on the internet. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, well I'll be around afterward for questions, thanks guys.